Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, session number seven of our series of ten presentations on the growth of government in U.S. history. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about World War II this morning, uh, the greatest war of all time, greatest uh, in the sense of most terrible, most deadly, uh, widest in scope, doing the most damage to the most human beings. Uh, I suppose in uh, some military eyes, that's great in another sense as well, but uh, for those of us who who think human life is uh, worth preserving, uh, it was a gigantic tragedy. As I mentioned earlier in talking about the uh, Versailles Treaty, and as others have mentioned this week as well, uh, World War II was uh, seen as early as 1919 as well nigh inevitable. <laughs> Uh, different people uh, had different views on when the fighting would break out again, but a great many intelligent people were quite convinced that sooner or later uh, Europe would go back to war. And certainly after the Nazis took control of the German uh, state in 1933, then uh, even more people began to see that war was inevitable. When uh, the war finally did begin in September 1939, uh, very few Americans uh, desired to participate in it. Uh, I would guess that no more than 10% had any enthusiasm at all for becoming involved in that war. Uh, during the interwar period, many Americans had become disillusioned with the American engagement in World War I. They had come to see it as a gigantic mistake, uh, as a tragedy, uh, if not for the world, then certainly for the United States, even though our losses had been trivial compared to those of the European belligerents. Uh, they were of some consequence to the to the uh, more than 100,000 uh, men who died uh, and uh, the several hundred thousand who sustained wounds. Uh, so uh, uh, Americans had taken considerable pain to, to prevent making that kind of mistake again. And uh, uh, the Congress had held uh, extensive hearings in the 1930s uh, investigating how the country had become involved in uh, the war, and uh, many people began to blame it on uh, merchants of death, on arms dealers and uh, bankers connected with them, and people who were s seeking s simply to, to profit in a commercial way from uh, involvement in war. Uh, although I, I think those hearings had some value. Uh, the the uh, so-called Nye Committee hearings make interesting reading even now. The, there, there are many, many volumes of testimony and evidence accumulated by the committee staff. Uh, uh, I, I think the idea that became popular that World War I was simply a conspiracy of merchants of death was extremely simplistic. Uh, not that there was not a grain of truth in it, but uh, certainly uh, I think had uh, less weight than, than simply uh, Woodrow Wilson's psychology, uh, which was a much more important factor in how the United States entered World War I. But in, in any event, uh, the result of uh, this inquiry uh, was passage of a series of neutrality acts in the mid-1930s uh, designed to, uh, to uh, prevent uh, the kinds of engagements that might entangle the United States in future wars. Uh, so that was the, the climate of opinion in this country with regard to war. Uh, Americans were very anti-war 
in general in the 20s and 30s. And uh, so in 1939, they, they wished very much to stay out. President Roosevelt uh, made an announcement urging people to uh, uh, remain neutral, uh, but he did not urge them to remain neutral in spirit, unlike Wilson in 1914, who had urged people to, to be neutral uh, all around in their sentiments as well as their actions. So, Roosevelt made no secret of his hatred of uh, Hitler and of his uh, sympathy for the British and uh, the others who were opposing Hitler. So uh, it was quite clear uh, already, uh, and indeed the president made no attempt to conceal, uh, that his sympathies lay uh, with the uh, uh, anti-Nazi forces. Uh, and during the next two years, uh, although the president progressively revealed uh, his own actions uh, in, in moving the, the country toward more active involvement in opposing uh, Germany, uh, he, he was very, very cagey and deceptive and careful never to get too far out in front of public opinion. I think we always need to remember that Franklin Roosevelt was not an ideologue. He was simply an extraordinarily ambitious politician with no principles, whatever. And his major objective was always to personally succeed in retaining power and to augment that power and to use it in the service of crushing his political enemies. So he, he was working uh, toward getting the country into the war in, in a variety of ways. And ultimately, as we all know, uh, he succeeded by bringing a, the country into the war by the so-called back door, that being uh, provoking the Japanese by a series of increasingly stringent trade restrictions and ultimata until the Japanese were put in a position they regarded as desperate and from which they could escape only uh, by attempting uh, to stage a kind of blitzkrieg of their own that would so discourage the Americans that they would uh, uh, be willing to come to terms with Japan. And uh, the, of course, they knew themselves that was a gamble, but they felt they had no good choice but to make that gamble. And of course, they lost. But uh, when the Germans invaded the Low Countries and, and France and Norway in 1940 uh, in the spring, af after the winter of so-called Sitzkrieg, Sitzkrieg, I always love that term, uh, uh, the, the quick success of the, of, uh, the German forces, uh, we have to remember, France was not regarded as a weakling country at the beginning of 1940. It was a major military power. And the ease with which the German army rolled over the French defenses astonished the world and astonished many Americans and made many of them begin to change their ideas and to think that uh, the Germans were really a more powerful threat than they had imagined. And uh, uh, many people began to uh, agree with the pro-war argument that uh, the, the United States needed to do much more to build up its defensive capabilities. And from that point forward, Congress began to appropriate large sums of money for uh, building up the U.S. armed forces and munitions industries here. And uh, U.S. preparation for war uh, grew bigger and bigger and bigger from mid-1940 uh, onward. So uh, by the time uh, the Japanese did attack Pearl Harbor in December 1941, uh, we had increased the size of the army uh, several fold and had uh, instituted conscription and uh, had begun systematically to develop uh, industrial capacities uh, viewed as necessary for supplying uh, a large armed force. Uh, the president uh, eventually 
uh, not only provoke the Japanese, but um, uh, actually uh, placed uh, the United States Navy in a state of war against Germany. I believe Roosevelt hoped uh, to provoke the, the Germans so that they would do something that he could use as a pretext for seeking a declaration of war. But the Germans uh, refused to be drawn into that uh, ambush, as it were, <laughs> Uh, and uh, despite uh, provocations, despite U.S. Uh, uh, naval actions, uh, uh, shooting, uh, uh, dropping uh, uh, mines uh, on German submarines, assisting the British forces with information, uh, hunting uh, German submarines, and so forth, none of this provoked the Germans to actually come out and either declare war on the United States or engage in some substantial military action against U.S. forces, although they did shoot back on some occasions. Uh, so uh, this was the situation going on in 1941. 1941 was an extremely nervous year for Americans because uh, they, they weren't at all sure what was going to happen. The president was not honestly revealing to people what his policies were and uh, what the military was doing in the North Atlantic and, and with regard to Japan. And, and so people were in, a, in something of a fog. Uh, they, they had far fewer alternative news sources than we have today with the technology of our time. So they were much more dependent on what they were told by official sources. And uh, I think they, many of them at least, tended to believe what they were told quite naively. Uh, at least uh, nowadays there are a few cynics in the public, uh, although I suspect most Americans are just as naive now as they were in 1941. As I say, the draft was begun. That uh, was enacted in September 1940. And in the beginning, it was a law that uh, applied to just a one-year period. Uh, a number of uh, men were, were conscripted and trained for military service uh, during that year. And as the year drew to a near close, uh, people had to decide whether to use the authority of the draft law to extend the term of service uh, which uh, could be done. The original draft law of 1940 had a provision that if the president declared that national security required it, the men could be kept longer than one year. Uh, but uh, people were leery of doing that for political reasons because that looked like uh, going back on what had been promised these men. They had been told, look, we're, we're dragging you into the army against your will, but it's only for a year and then you'll be free. But uh, if then they were going to turn around and say, no, take it back. <laughs> you have to stay in the army. Uh, that might have created a lot of furor. So they were apprehensive about doing that. At the same time, by, by August of 1941, things looked very, very dangerous uh, with regard to the security position of the United States, at least in some American eyes, and so they thought it was really imperative that they not disband this large army that they had just put together uh, and let these trained men go back to civilian life. Uh, ultimately, they did extend the draft. They passed the new draft act in August 1941, uh, but this was a, a one of those rare examples uh, where one vote was decisive, where literally every vote counted, at least every vote in the House of Representatives, because this draft extension law passed in the House by a vote of 203 to 202. So any members uh, uh, changing his vote in the majority uh, would have transformed the majority into a minority. Uh, and... Uh, the law did pass, the men were kept, new men were drafted. Once again, the draft system operated with local civilian boards doing the dirty work, selecting the specific individuals who would have to serve. 
uh, it worked so beautifully in World War I, they, uh, they put the same system back into effect. Uh, the law provided uh, penalties of five years in prison or $10,000 fine uh, for draft evasion. Uh, that was a huge penalty at the time. Uh, and uh, relatively few men in World War II evaded the draft compared to World War I, uh, probably because uh, this war was simply one that had more popular approval than World War I had. Some did evade the draft. Uh, I had an uncle that uh, kept uh, going AWOL time and again and uh, spent quite a bit of time in prison as a result. Uh, he was a family disgrace, by the way. I was not brought up to regard him as a, as a family hero. <laughs> uh, about 10 million men were drafted altogether during World War II. Uh, of a total of 16 million who served at some time in the armed forces. So uh, we've got the bulk of everybody who served actually drafted. And, and as I've mentioned before, many of those who joined voluntarily did so in order to, to avoid being drafted, uh, particularly uh, people would join either the Navy or the uh, Army Air Corps, and that meant, uh, if nothing else, that they wouldn't be in the infantry stuck in a filthy mud hole with artillery shells exploding all around them. So they, they uh, at least avoided that, although I, I would have to say that the ones who who became air crew in the Army Air Corps uh, made a very bad bargain so far as preserving their lives because the, uh, the bomber crews over Europe sustained enormous casualties. Uh, and if you've never read uh, Catch-22, uh, I recommend it highly. <laughs> it's one of the great, uh, great war books. Uh, Unlike anything else I've ever read, I, I don't even know how to quite describe the kind of book Catch-22 is. It took me a little while to quite get in the spirit of the, the way it's written, but once I did, it, uh, it had a great effect on me. After uh, the country entered the war, uh, the Congress passed a War Powers Act in December <laughs> and then a second one in March of 1942. And uh, these acts gave a tremendous power to the president uh, or his agents to, uh, uh, first of all, reorganize the government uh, without any congressional approval. Uh, you may remember this, this is a uh, power that was given to Wilson by the Overman Act during World War I, but at that time uh, it was extremely controversial. Uh, many people thought that the Overman Act made Wilson a dictator because it allowed him to rearrange the functions and duties of the executive branch of the government on his own without any congressional approval. Uh, he could create new agencies, shift the duties of agencies from one to another and so forth, uh, basically remake the government at his pleasure. Uh, but in uh, uh, 1940. Uh, 41, Congress simply gave Roosevelt that power with hardly a squeak uh, uttered in protest. So it, uh, it, it's an example of how once precedents have been set, then it becomes very easy to do the second time or the third time what has been done once before. Uh, uh, the president was also given the power to, to uh, make contracts for the acquisition of uh, war material in a very flexible way. Uh, before the war, there had been quite strict rules about uh, how the government could contract with suppliers and uh, requirements for competitive bidding and uh, sealed bids and uh, automatic selection of the of the lowest price bidder and, and a variety of rules like that had been put into effect, again, to foreclose so-called war profiteering uh, that uh, had seemed to many people to have taken place in World War I. Uh, 
Uh, but under these War Powers Act, the president was put in a position not exactly to contract in any way he wanted, but to have much more flexibility and, and in, in particular to, to avoid a, a sealed bid, low price type selection of suppliers. And most of the contra contracts the government made with suppliers in World War II were negotiated contracts. That meant that one of the government procurement officers just sat down with General Motors and they put together a contract and, and when they were happy with it, they, they signed their names and that was that. Uh, there were some restrictions. The government was forbidden to make contracts on, on the basis of paying cost plus percentage of cost. Many such contracts had been made in World War I, and if you think about that for maybe two seconds, you see what kind of incentive it creates for the supplier. Uh, this, if the higher the supplier's costs, the greater the supplier's profit. <laughs> so in World War I, many suppliers acted accordingly and uh, ran up huge costs of producing whatever they supplied the government and then added 15% of that amount on top as their fee. Well, uh, contracts in World War II were usually uh, cost plus fixed fee. That is, the absolute amount of the profit, if you want to call it that, uh, was set uh, apart from whatever the cost turned out to be. And then supposedly uh, government uh, overseers uh, would try to make sure that, that uh, the manufacturer kept his costs down to, to uh, minimum levels. But in any event, the government was not going to be paying a bigger margin of fee on top of the costs if they did run up. Uh, as it turned out, the, the way they estimated the appropriate fixed fee was by applying a kind of percentage of the estimated cost. So in practice, the cost plus fixed fee contracts mimicked the old cost plus percentage of, uh, uh, of cost type contracts. And it, this switch did not make a great deal of difference. Uh, uh, as it turned out, uh, uh, these contracts became extremely flexible. They, they were really not worth the paper they were written on because if, if contractors got into a, a, a trouble, a problem, their costs ran up, they would simply appeal for adjustments and those adjustments would be made. So as uh, one historian uh, of, of this episode wrote, uh, contracting became a family affair so that uh, they all viewed themselves as working toward the same objective and they weren't going to worry too much about formalities of containing costs or worrying about profits. Uh, but uh, just to make sure that, uh, that uh, the government wasn't stolen blind by the suppliers, uh, they, uh, Congress created the renegotiation laws and th this was a, a way of making contracts even more uncertain because under renegotiation laws, uh, the government went back, examined contracts uh, after they had been fulfilled, and then took some of the money back that it had paid to the supplier, saying, well, you got too much. Uh, some, of the, some of these uh, renegotiation actions were contested in the courts, went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, which ultimately ruled that the government's claims uh, that uh, some contract or profit was excessive uh, didn't have to be defined. See, normally when people go to court and talk about uh, what is someone's obligation under an agreement, they say, well, what did the agreement provide? How, how did the government define excessive profit? Uh, how did it define what was due in renegotiation? And, and, it, and it turned out the court just accepted a circular definition. Uh, uh, appropriate renegotiation was appropriate renegotiation. Uh, whatever the government decided to do, the court would say was okay. But uh, at all events, many of these contractors did very well uh, in World War II. They, they made... Uh, extraordinary rates of return, given that they, they were facing very little risk. 
because if they got in trouble, they rene renegotiated the deal. So in those circumstances, uh, the risk was very low, and, and uh, there was really no excuse for the high rates of return given the low amount of actual risk. Uh, strangely enough, the, the smaller contractors made even higher profits than the big ones, uh, but the big ones did quite well also. The, uh, the government's huge spending for war purposes began to drive up prices. You know, they had been steady for almost a decade, but they began to go up rapidly in late 1940 and in 1941, and, and even quicker uh, in 1942. So uh, Congress passed price control legislation. Before that, uh, some boards created by the president by executive order had been attempting to jawbone uh, suppliers into holding down prices uh, not very successfully. Uh, a first uh, price control act in early 1942 uh, proved to be unsatisfactory and, and in October 1942 the Economic Stabilization Act was passed and, and uh, that worked a little better at helping the government at least hold down uh, visible price increases. I emphasize the word visible because uh, what, what came into effect by the end of 1942 was a fairly effective comprehensive price control system, very complex, uh, full of exceptions and changes and, and uh, continual juggling uh, that, that affected uh, virtually the entire civilian economy. Now, by that time, more than a third of what was being produced was being sold to the military, and all those prices are being determined by the military purchasers and the suppliers when they de decide on their c terms of contract. But, but the civilian economy is subject to price control in almost every respect, even rents uh, as well as the prices of ordinary goods and services. And uh, the the laws tempted a lot of evasion uh, and avoidance in, in countless ways. If there's one thing people are clever about, it, it's avoiding price controls. So uh, not only did they have the usual kinds of consequences, uh, such things as, as people standing in long lines to buy goods that were priced below market clearing levels uh, officially, uh, with all the kinds of discrimination that always go along with that. Uh, I've heard many of the older guys tell stories about how they'd, say, send their wives or girlfriends to the butcher shop to buy meat because if they themselves went in and asked for a steak, the butcher would say, I'm sorry, I don't have any. Uh, but if a good-looking woman went in and said, <laughs> do you have any meat today, Mr. Butcher? Uh, you know, they'd have a better chance that he would find some. Uh, so, uh, whenever a pr price is not available to be used as a rationing device, that means sellers are in a position to use other criteria, whatever they happen to, to find pleasing, uh, whether it's selling to their relatives or friends or people of the same race or, or people who look better or, or whatever they, they choose. And, and World War II was rampant with all these different kinds of discrimination because of these price controls. Uh, in many cases, it, price controls created such shortages that, that uh, people began to complain they could not get essential consumer goods. And so the government's response to th that was to equip every man, woman, and child with uh, these ration booklets. See, I've brought mine today to, to be ready just in case. So one never knows when the government's going to reinstitute a program. Uh, this one uh, was issued to a, a child age two, or age is written on the booklet, and uh, most of these uh, coupons were never used. They're still in the booklet. Uh, there were several different kinds. They came in different colors, uh, depending on what they were to be used for, and uh, rationing was applied to a variety of consumer goods such as uh, meats, 
uh, clothing, shoes, uh, sugar, uh, canned goods, butter, uh, lard. Uh, so when you went to buy any of these rationed goods, there was still a money price. So you had to pay the money price, which is supposed to be the controlled official price permitted by the government. Plus you had to surrender the uh, second price, a certain number of these ration coupons. And uh, by that means, the government uh, attempted to make available uh, to everybody at least a minimal amount of all of these uh, essential consumer goods. Uh, not, even with rationing, a lot of consumer goods were very, very scarce, uh, particularly uh, shoes and, and uh gasoline and tires for automobiles, and, and so people had to make do. Uh, they had to, to make repairs to old uh, cars or to keep uh, fixing their tires even though they, they were worn out and, and, and kept failing time and again. Uh, uh, one of our great family stories uh, has to do with uh, my father's moving in, uh, right after I was born in uh, the beginning of 1944, uh, to Oregon to work in a shipyard there. And on the trip from uh, Oklahoma to, to Portland, Oregon, in a, in a uh, Model A Ford with worn-out tires, uh, uh, they had uh, 40-some flat tires along the way. And every time they had a flat, they would have to stop, and, and my dad would jack up the car and, and take off the tire and take out the tube. In those days, tires had rubber tubes inside them. And he would get out his patch kit, uh, find, find where the, the hole was, put a patch on, uh, take a pump, pump the tire back up, get in the car and continue the trip. And uh, he, he, he had to do that more than 40 times. Uh, to get from Oklahoma to Oregon. <laughs> but uh, that was the situation that people had to endure during the war because of the shortage of tires. Uh, uh, on one occasion, when they passed through Salt Lake City, they stopped and, and uh, had lunch at uh, a drugstore lunch counter. I don't know if any, some of you older fellows remember when they used to have those. And... Uh, and uh, after they got up and left, uh, they, they, they drove down the road, and, and 30 or 40 miles later, my mom suddenly realized she had left her purse sitting on the counter, and it had all their ration coupons. <laughs> so they had to turn around and go back. And fortunately, they got the purse. But these things were essential. You couldn't go through even normal life without having the access that they gave you to necessities. There was much counterfeiting. Uh, the mafia got heavily involved in uh, not only dealing in ration coupons, but stealing the real ones, reselling them, uh, entering into schemes where they weren't collected when they should have been, uh, uh, making false reports, so naturally, whenever you have uh, laws that, uh, that distort what people want to do in an open market, criminality is encouraged. And that was uh, an effect that was quite uh, serious in World War II. Some historians like to tell stories as if everybody fell in line with doing patriotic duty during World War II, but that's a complete myth. Uh, many people were looking out for themselves just as many people always do, no matter what the situation. The uh, attempt to control the economy extended to, uh, to uh, trying to allocate raw materials uh, so that they would be made accessible, for, first of all, to people producing essential war materials. Uh, the government instituted a new priority system similar to the one the War Industries Board had used in World War I and almost immediately concluded, uh, as I suggested the War Industries Board would have concluded if the war had lasted a little longer in 1918-19, that this was a bad system. 
priority inflation began to occur, the system broke down, it really wasn't serving to uh, distinguish uh, different demanders by their military urgency. Uh, too many exceptions were made, uh, there was continual request for higher priority ratings and adjustments. And uh, over the war years, the government constantly juggled its control apparatus. Uh, it, it was almost on a daily basis uh, altering the uh, requirements and the way the system operated. Uh, a big change was made in 1943 with something called the Controlled Materials Plan. And many historians still write this up as if, as if it were a raving success and really won the war for the United States. Uh, under this plan, uh, uh, three key commodities were, were controlled in a particular way, uh, uh, steel, copper, and aluminum. Uh, aluminum had become a critical material because uh, aircraft uh, during World War II were almost all made uh, with aluminum uh, fuselages. And uh, the aluminum industry boomed. It had been a fairly small industry before the war, but it grew very big during the war uh, in, in response to an enormous growth of the aircraft industry. Uh, the military suppliers supplied something like 300,000 aircraft to the government during the war. If you think now about how many Lockheed Martin produces in a given year, you know, it's a few dozen. Uh, and I grant the modern air, airplanes are a lot uh, more technically advanced than the ones of World War II, but nonetheless, the difference in scale is mind-boggling. 300,000 airplanes in five years. Uh, all kinds, everything from you know, little trainer aircraft to, uh, to B-29s. And, and in last year of the war, even jet fighter planes were being uh, made. Uh, and the B-29 was a technologically very advanced aircraft. It was the most uh, advanced aircraft ever built to that time. Uh, but, uh, uh, but all this required a huge demand for aluminum. Copper was used in many industrial purposes, and all these shell casings uh, were made of brass. So uh, there was that, and steel, of course, went into a multitude of different uses from building ships and tanks, uh, uh, guns, on, on down the line. So what the government did was it, it decided to give a fixed amount of each of these three materials to each of the three main uh, military demanders, the War Department, the Navy Department, and the Maritime Commission. The Maritime Commission was the, the old shipping board. The name had been changed during the 1930s. And just as the old shipping board had been building merchant ships through the Emergency Fleet Corporation during World War I, the Maritime Commission engaged in building or contracting with shipbuilders on a massive scale uh, during World War II to crank out thousands of, of merchant ships uh, because remember this is, a, this is an overseas war everything that's produced here in the United States and all these men who are trained here have to go forth and the only way they can get there uh, at least in any large numbers and be supplied appropriately is through ocean shipping and the United States didn't have much of a, a merchant fleet when the war began so they had to create that again, almost from scratch, just as they had back in 1917. This time, however, they were much more successful. I mentioned that in World War I, very few of the ships hit the water by the end of the war. In World War II, thousands of them were completed, and in fact, mass production techniques were devised uh, so that they could uh, actually put together these ships in, in, in a few weeks, normally. Uh, they, they, they welded them together rather than riveting them, and it was a much quicker way. And they weren't very good ships, uh, but then they were probably just going to be torpedoed anyhow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they produced a lot of these shoddy, slow-moving merchant ships. They might only make 10 knots speed, uh, but if they just kept steaming along, they'd eventually get to Guam. And uh, so they, they 
consumed a lot of steel. So the Maritime Commission and the two military departments were given certain amounts of aluminum, copper, and steel, and then they, in turn, made assignments down the chain to their, their contractors, and the contractors then divvied up their amount to the subcontractors, and the allocations flowed down in that fashion. Now, notice this is physical allocation. This is classic central planning. You say, where's the price system? And the answer is it doesn't exist. This is an attempt to, to allocate resources without the use of prices. Uh, the first decisions made up here at the top are made entirely on the basis of technical and military information. There's no economic information, properly speaking, involved at all. And in fact, this whole control apparatus amounted to a massive system of central planning. Uh, because we had a centrally planned system, not that there weren't any prices out there, there were still prices, they just weren't market prices. They were arbitrary prices, controlled prices, set prices, government negotiated prices, in other words, prices with no economic rationality underneath them. So th this, this whole apparatus uh, cannot be understood in a way that's comparable to the pre-war economy or the post-war economy where most of the prices did result predominantly from market forces. And that's been a, a difference that very few economists and economic historians have understood. They've tended to look at events and to track macroeconomic indices right through the war as if you could draw smooth series. But anything that relies on prices has a discontinuity once we get to 1942 uh, because the, the uh, validity of the price system dissolves and becomes spurious at that point. Well, of course, what most Americans liked about the war was the fact that uh, unemployment disappeared. And one can understand that. A lot of people had been unemployed, uh, at least at some time, during the 1930s, uh, some of them for a long time, uh, and even those who were working in the 1930s tended to live in fear that they too might lose their jobs at any moment. So apprehensive, uh, apprehension about unemployment had become pervasive among Americans uh, after 10 years of the Great Depression, and when the defense buildup began to absorb the labor force and, and to provide opportunities for people to go into shipyards or uh, bomber plants and, and get what seemed to be good paying jobs, people were happy. Uh, they, they, they had the feeling that good times were here again. And in fact, there was constant complaining by the military authorities that people were too happy that, you know, they're, they're, they're forgetting that there's a war on. And in fact, that was one of the slogans of the day. Don't you know there's a war on? As if, you know, people were so content with their state of affairs that they, they didn't care what was going on in New Guinea. You know, that was somebody else's problem. Well, indeed, that was one way to think about it, and I, I'm sure a great many people did think about it that way. Now, this is itself an overdone interpretation because, as I mentioned, life was not all that great. You might have had a good job in a bomber factory, but this fact remained. You couldn't get new tires for your car. You couldn't get a new car because no new cars were made after March 1942 until late in 1945 when they started being manufactured again on a very small scale. So... Uh, you couldn't live a normal life in terms of uh, civilian goods and services, but nonetheless, people could say, I'm making a lot of money every week, and, and I'm putting it in the bank, or I'm, I'm buying uh, government bonds, and, and so even if I can't enjoy a better life right now, at least I'm, I'm building up my financial wealth so that s someday in the future I'll be able to cash in and uh, get the goods. Well, this whole disappearance of uh, unemployment phenomenon 
has been almost completely misunderstood by macroeconomists. This is really a very simple story, and it doesn't require any macroeconomic theory whatsoever. All it requires is recognizing how many people were drawn into the armed forces. And to demonstrate that, uh, for an article I wrote uh, more than 10 years ago, I, I used this table in which I divided uh, the employment and unemployment up in such a way as I have the proportion of the uh, of the total labor force, that's uh, persons in the civilian labor force plus persons in the armed forces. Okay. I divided the, that whole group up, uh, and this is the percentages here. The, that's a percentage in non-defense employment. So if we start here in 1940, only 82% of the total labor force is engaged in non-defense employment, and, and that's mainly because 15.7% are unemployed. <laughs> and you'll see there's a, a small percentage, less than 2%, uh, in defense employment at that time. And that, in, uh, that included the armed forces and the people working in arms industries. Now look what happens as the war buildup proceeds. Uh, yes, indeed, a civilian unemployment, this is the thing that the economists normally look at, it disappears. By 1944, it, it's, it's 1%. That's no unemployment. And, and it seems to correspond with reality because if you go back and read the news events of the day, you find that, that labor was extremely scarce. So employers would hire anybody. Uh, they did extraordinary things. I, I read of one case in which agents went out in the streets of Detroit and cruised around looking for street walkers. And when they saw a girl, they would pull over and ask if she wanted to come work in the factory. <laughs> so this was not the normal way of acquiring factory workers. Uh, but employers were desperate. Anybody, you know, get a warm body into the plant. Anybody who could work. Uh, young kid. Uh, kids who otherwise would have still been in high school. Instead, they dropped out and found what seemed to be fairly good paying jobs. Old people who had been retired decided, oh, I'm going to go back to work. Uh, women who were normally expecting to stay at home and take care of children decided instead... They'd go out and take a job in a plant somewhere. So uh, unusual opportunities did exist. So it looks as if, yeah, there was no unemployment. A uh, booming economy, the likes of which were never seen before or since. But that's because never before or since were, were the likes of this seen. Defense employment. <laughs> The armed forces went from less than half a million officers and men altogether in 1940 to more than 12 million in 1945. 12 million. Out of a total labor force of only about 54 million men and women. <laughs> That's a gigantic a number of people in the armed forces themselves and then we've got a comparable number of people working in defense production facilities. So by the time we get to the peak years of the war here, 43, 4, 5, we've got four out of every ten members of the total labor force engaged directly or indirectly in uh, producing war goods and services. Well, of course we didn't have any unemployment. <laughs> but... What we had, uh, I, I created this final column to make the point a little more uh, obvious. I said, this, this, let's call this residuum everybody who's not in non-defense employment. What happens to the residuum during the war? Do we diminish it? No, actually we, we increase it hugely. It's just that we, we, we take... Uh, people who weren't doing anything and put a lot of them to work uh, building the means of destruction. So if you're making war, that's a good move. Uh, but if you're thinking about human well-being, uh, that's a very uh, questionable kind of move. Uh, that's certainly not 
uh, an index that you've moved into a more prosperous condition of economic life uh, when you're shifting major parts of the labor force into producing the means of death and destruction. This apparent economic prosperity shows up in a lot of standard measures of what the, what's happening to the economy. If you look at the upper line here, we've got uh, your orthodox measure of, of the size of the economy. The gross domestic product uh, adjusted for changes in the price level. So uh, we, we, we've got here what appears to be this gigantic boom during the war. But underneath it, I've charted government spending. And what we can see very clearly is that the, the boom consists of nothing but government spending. And if we look at what the government was spending for, we find that it's almost all to produce war goods and services. Here we've again shown government spending. That's the dark bars. And we see this gigantic jump during World War II. Uh, and I've measured it here as a percent of gross domestic product. So it's not only becoming bigger in absolute terms, uh, but even though the whole GDP is growing, the proportion of that bigger G GDP uh, that comes from government is growing also, until it jumps up uh, to some 45, 46% during the peak years of World War II. Uh, again, there was never, ever before or since any experience <coughs> comparable to this or even close to this. Uh, this was a completely militarized economy. Okay. Now, the, the light-colored bars in this chart show uh, private investment spending. I was mentioning yesterday that one of the major reasons for the prolongation of the Great Depression was the failure of private investment spending to, to revive, particularly spending for long-term capital. Uh, and you see that here. Uh, back in 1929, about 16% of the GDP came from private investment spending, and that was typical of the, of the la latter part of the 1920s. That's a what you might call a normal uh, proportion of investment in the American historical experience. Uh, it, of course, collapsed during the Great Depression, and then it comes back. It never comes back to 16%, even here in 1937, before it collapses again. And so it, it, it's not until we get to the war here that we're just about to get private investment back to where it was in the late 1920s. But then what happens? There's a second great contraction, if you want, uh, of private investment during World War II. Uh, and it's a kind of mirror image of what the government is doing. Uh, now, this government spending includes everything, but as, in fact, the government did engage in what I call the socialization of investment, taking that turn of phrase from Keynes' famous uh, plea in the final chapter of the general theory that uh, in order to guarantee full employment, the government would have to undertake a socialization of investment. Well, that's what the United States did during World War II. Private investment plummeted partly because private investors simply were, were unable to get raw materials assigned to them in order to undertake any investments and partly because there was no incentive to invest in anything but war plants in the circumstances. And why would you want to invest private resources in war plants uh, given all the risks of recouping the investment? You don't know how long this war is going to last. You don't know how much of your profits will be taken back by renegotiation officers. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's just too risky for private individuals uh, to tolerate 
in most instances. And even when they want to do it, it's not clear they can because the government might not permit them to undertake certain kinds of investments. So private investment almost disappears and it's replaced by government investment. Who pays for all these war plants, these shipyards, these uh, bomb factories? Well, the taxpayers pay for them. The, the money comes out of the, the Treasury Department and is spent by the War Department. And the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, through, largely through its subsidiary, the Defense Plant Corporation, uh, and altogether during the war, uh, the government itself expended about $17 billion just on industrial facilities. Steel mills, shipyards, and so forth. Now, if you look at the official data, and I've just written an article on all of this. If you're interested, it's available at the Independent Institute's website. You'll find that the official data that are still the ones you find if you go to the Commerce Department's website for national income and product accounts. If you follow those data on uh, government investment, what they'll tell you is altogether during World War II, the government invested uh, in, in, uh, about $100 billion. And you would say they were adding that much to the capital stock. I just said 17. What's the difference? Well, in the official data, they count as investment what the government spent for purely military installations, bases, training grounds, and all the rest of it. And they spent about $15 billion on those things. Remember, we've got an armed force that went from almost nothing to $12 million. It took hundreds and hundreds of bases and barracks and military hospitals and parade grounds and, and gunnery ranges and, and so forth to house and train, equip all of these people. Okay? So they spent a huge amount just to build up uh, that infrastructure that has no purpose other than military purpose. Uh, in that neighborhood, it's about equivalent to what the government spent on industrial projects. I'd have to check my uh, figures to be precise about it, Brad. Uh, but even you add those two together, they're only adding up to, to $35 billion. What's the other 65 that the official data tell us the government invested? Well, that turns out to be purchase of so-called military durables. <laughs> That's weapons platforms <laughs> and ammunition. The stuff doesn't wear away uh, real quickly, so it's regarded as durable, and the Commerce Department decided to call it capital. So the government's official investment consists overwhelmingly of B-29s, battleships, destroyers, uh, canisters of poison gas, and so forth. Talk about weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we had arsenals. One of them, I looked up a website for uh, Huntsville here in Alabama, and there's, there, there are interesting data about the history of it and about wh what they did when they, when they decommissioned it after World War II. They were making mustard gas and, and all kinds of poison gas mortar shells and and just a, a litany of horrible weaponry there in World War II. Uh, uh, in the event, probably, that the other side began to use them. Uh, and the main reason that uh, poison gas is not used in war warfare is entirely because it's a lousy weapon. It's too hard to control. It's not really that effective. And, and uh, so it's just not an effective weapon. That's why... Uh, it, it, it died out, as it were, as a technique of war. Uh, but it makes great propaganda, as we all know. Uh, <coughs> this display is one that I, I think tells a lot of story uh, very quickly. What I've done here is to 
show, first of all, in the solid line, the standard measure of gross domestic product adjusted for changes in the price level. So this is so-called real GDP. And uh, it follows that profile. And, and uh, what, what we see here, if we build in a trend line, uh, if, if the economy were to have grown smoothly between 1929 and 1948, so we connect these two business cycle peaks, uh, instead of going through all these gyrations in order to get there, uh, it would have followed this trend line. And that's the kind of way statisticians uh, uh, determine what the economy's capacity to produce is in the event that it deviates from that. Normally, it can only deviate downward because how can you produce more than your capacity? That doesn't make a lot of good sense. So what we see if we, if we look here at these deviations from the growth trend uh, and where the economy actually went is the Great Depression. All of this shortfall here uh, running up uh, to 1942. And that makes sense to us. Okay. But now look what happens. During World War II, we have this big bulge above trend. Well, how can you produce more than your capacity? <laughs> how is that conceivable? What is going on in these data? Well, what is going on is a statistical artifact. What uh, economists have, uh, for the most part, accepted as the reality of a production boom during World War II uh, is a complete statistical fiction. And uh, the reason this uh, uh, apparent boom uh, is shown in the data is that the economy is being treated as if it, it could be measured in the same way during World War II that it's measured during peacetime periods. That is, all of these goods and services are being priced somehow in order to be added up into GDP. And the rationale of a, a, a normal GDP calculation is we use market prices uh, to weight the quantities of goods. So if we're going to add apples and oranges, we add them according to their market price. And that supposedly gives us some kind of aggregate of value that is being produced. So we do that during World War II, but since we don't have a market economy anymore, <laughs> The prices we use are not really market prices. What the government statisticians have done is just pretend that they are. They've treated these artificial prices that were the result of all this bureaucratic pulling and hauling during the, the war as if they still gave us measures of relative valuation for different goods and services. So here during the war, if we produce 100 B-29s, uh, how much do we add to GDP? Well, how much was paid for each one? We use that price. <laughs> Similarly, right down the line, for all the howitzers and bazookas and canisters of poison gas, uh, use all the government official bureaucratically determined prices and add it all up. And that's where we get the war boom. This is just one gigantic piece of fiction. And it's, uh, except for a handful of people, uh, most of them uh, Austrian economists, uh, it's simply not been recognized and to this day is still not recognized uh, as uh, not just an anomaly, not just uh, something that has a, a straightforward, sensible explanation like people working harder during the war. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's just... Uh, an illusion. Now, to some extent, we can get around that, and I've tried to show, uh, make an important point, by taking all the government output away from GDP, subtract that, and just take the private part of GDP. Okay? That's what I show in the dark bars charted here. Okay? Now, if we, if we do that, uh, our trend line is now this lower one, the dashed line connecting 1929 and 1948 here. 
uh, if the private economy had grown smoothly between those two years instead of falling short as it did, it would have moved along that path. Uh, but instead, we have the Great Depression. And uh, private output falls drastically, recovers some, not fully, falls back, recovers. Uh, and then, uh, after 1941, when it's uh, just a, about recovered, not fully, say there's still a shortfall here between private output in 41 and where it ought to have been had it grown smoothly, uh, uh, then it falls back again. This is a, a decisive refutation of all these claims about carnivals of consumption during World War II. Historians have looked around and said, people never had it so good. Literally, and that's what they say. People never had it so good. Well, I say that people in 1943 had it much better in 1941. And uh, that's apart from the further adjustment that needs somehow to be made for the fact that many of their choices have been taken away from them totally. The things they are consuming in 1942 and 43 are not the things they would choose to consume but for government restrictions. Many people wanted to buy a new car in 1943 but couldn't because none uh, were permitted to be produced by the government. Many people wanted more than two new pairs of shoes that year for their children. But they couldn't because rationing only gave them that much claim on shoes. So it was worse than the graph makes it seem to have been, but even the graph shows that during the war years, things were worse than they had been in 1941 for the private economy, which even then hadn't fully recovered. When we get, of course, to 1946 and the end of the war and government war spending uh, falls back drastically, it looks as if the whole economy is plummeting. Indeed, if you had been an honest mainstream macroeconomist, you would always have referred to the Great Depression of 1946. In fact, uh, Lowell Galloway and Rich Vetter wrote an article in the Review of Austrian Economics by that title, the Great Depression of 1946, to make the point that why isn't it known as that? The data show it. That's a bigger collapse than you had back here. Much steeper. Why does nobody talk about the Great Depression of 1946? It's because it's not a Great Depression. You don't go back and hear people moaning and groaning if you read the news of 1946. They're happy. They're delighted. Not only are they not going to get killed in the war, but they're home. They're not living in a mud hole. They're able to hope that they can improve their lives. And look what happens to the private economy. It jumps up. By this, by this measure, it, it jumps up in the neighborhood of 30% in one year. There was never, ever a year like that in our history. 30% increase in private output in one year. But that's an understatement of the reality. Because in 1946, if, if you wanted an extra pair of shoes, you could go down to the store and buy it. And you didn't have to have these damn things to do it either. So... People were much better off at the end of the war. This was the most splendid year in all of American economic history. Although standard data tell us it was a Great Depression. Because these standard data have misled the economics profession for more than half a century. Uh, I've been on a kind of crusade throughout my career as an economic historian to to make these points to my colleagues, and um, I haven't won this battle yet, but I think I'm making some progress, actually. My, uh, my 1992 article uh, has actually uh, had some impact on teaching uh, among economic historians, so I'm still hopeful that this lesson will, uh, will get through uh, eventually to everybody.
These are hard to see probably from the back of the room, but I want to uh, call these income tax data your attention because uh, they're important both for understanding how the war was financed and uh, for understanding how we got where we've been ever since. Uh, before World War I, as you, as you can see here, uh, uh, not even 15 million people uh, uh, filed an income tax return. And most of those uh, owed very little federal income tax. The income tax, even after the New Deal's efforts to uh, soak the rich, uh, which were, were strenuous but uh, didn't reach very far down into the middle class, uh, had left most people out of the reach of the income tax collector. Rates were fairly low at the bottom still. But with the war, Congress uh, changed the nature of the federal income tax uh, in a decisive way from still what we might call a class tax, not so much as the class tax before World War I, but, but still pretty much of that sort, to a mass tax. Uh, by the time we get to the end of the war, uh, we've, we, we've got 50 million people filing income tax returns, and, and they're not paying trivial amounts any longer either, even at the bottom. If you look at the first bracket here, there you, if you made over $4,000 in 1940, your marginal tax rate on the excess was 4.4%. Okay? Well, just in a few years, uh, if, you, if you made uh, $1,550, your marginal tax rate was, was 19% and then up to 23%. So uh, e even ordinary working people were quickly encountering tax rates that took a quarter of their earnings away uh, in federal income tax. And uh, uh, an, an income of $2,000 a year it was not very much during World War II. So m most people were making uh, more than that, uh, well over that, and, and therefore paying a lot of income tax. A at the top here, you see uh, Soak the Rich really uh, comes, comes uh, in with a vengeance so that the top rate goes all the way up to 94% uh, in the late latter years of the war. And uh, you only have to make $200,000 to encounter that rate. So uh, it was uh, the occasion for using the tax system, uh, not only to tax everybody, uh, but to uh, virtually confiscate uh, all incomes above a fairly low level. Uh, Roosevelt proposed seriously on more than one occasion during the war uh, to actually use a 100% tax on everybody above uh, very low levels, maybe $50,000 or $100,000 that the government would just take everything above uh, those amounts of income. Uh, Congress never was willing to go so far, but as you can see from what uh, was done, it, it went quite far nonetheless. Um, now, uh, I've put in the data down here below for 1950, 60, and 70 to show you that after the war ended, the tax system was retained pretty much as it had come to be at the peak of World War II. Uh, uh, low levels of income uh, for the first bracket, uh, pretty, pretty high rates even at the first bracket, uh, the 15 to 20% neighborhood, uh, and very high marginal tax rates for high-income people. Uh, so even as late as 1970, we still had this 72% marginal rate on earnings above $100,000. And thanks to inflation, uh, $100,000 wasn't all that much uh, in 1970. It was more than I was earning, but uh, nonetheless, there were a great many people who were earning at that rate and being subjected to a 72% marginal tax rate. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's European-style taxation. <laughs> and uh, so this, uh, this wartime shift of the income tax system uh, lasted a long time. It was one of the major legacies of the government's command economy. 
Uh, now, to some extent, it, it was still used after the war to bankroll military spending because we had the Cold War, and I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. But, uh, but to a large extent, this tax system that had been created for purposes of uh, funding the war turned out to be just a wonderful thing for the government to use to fund many other kinds of purposes and increasingly uh, to fund the welfare state in all its guises. Um, in 1946, uh, Congress passed the Employment Act as a, as a way of formally acknowledging uh, what many people had come to demand which is that the government take responsibility for maintaining high levels of employment and production in the economy. It was a kind of vow that henceforward we in the federal government will oversee the economy in the sort of Keynesian interest of, uh, of propping it up and making sure we never have another Great Depression or, or, or even a serious recession. And... Uh, uh, you can read that act, and it looks a really flabby language uh, in a way, but, uh, but, but, but it meant something, I think. It, it was a, a recognition in law that uh, never again would the federal government uh, say what the Cleveland administration had said back in the 1890s, that this is not our business to give people work or to uh, provide for... Uh, economic misfortune. Uh, that's simply not an appropriate constitutional function of the federal government. Now, it was uh, formally accepted as a function. Uh, during the war, about $50 billion of, uh, of the 300 or so billion spent on the war took the form of so-called Lend-Lease, which is to say it was given uh, mostly to Britain and the Soviet Union uh, so that the, they could uh, get on with the, their engagement in the war. And uh, that, too, set a precedent. Uh, on the one hand, we got the Marshall Plan in 1948, uh, a program for, for transferring large amounts of money to Western European countries, ostensibly to... Uh, to, to help them revive their economy so they would be more resistant to communism. Uh, but the Marshall Plan e easily, uh, even after it ended formally, uh, uh, transmogrified into foreign aid in general. And so for the past 50 years, the United States has, has uh, been routinely engaged in collecting money from taxpayers and giving it to dictators in Zaire and and Nicaragua and other places that the State Department and the CIA in their wisdom decided to needed the taxpayers' money. So we got that legacy as well directly out of World War II. We got many others, and, and the one I'll just mention in closing here is that I, I, I think because of this great event and the way it had, had affected everybody and because at the end, uh, the United States came out on the winning side, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, the Soviet Union was the big winner, uh, but, if, but that the Americans could properly consider themselves among the victors and take great credit for being there. Uh, people looked at the federal government and said, it accomplished this amazing thing. It, uh, it built up this great military machine. It crushed the the Japanese and Nazi aggressors. It uh, sent troops all over the world. It aided allies. It, uh, it rescued people from uh, the, the oppression of dictators. Uh, uh, the federal government has done something magnificent. Uh, if it can do that, well, surely it can do lesser tasks. It can eliminate poverty or provide decent housing to everybody or, or make sure that the educational system is, is improved or that people's health care is uh, attended to. Uh, pe people took away from World War II a kind of faith in the capacity of the federal government to do great things. And beyond the faith uh, that it could, uh, an expectation that it, that it should.
It can. Let's get it going. All right, let's get started here. Why, why let this magnificent potential go to waste? So the ideological change that uh, resulted from American involvement in World War II was in, in some ways uh, the most auspicious uh, of all its consequences, I believe. Even business people, uh, many of whom had still been hostile to the federal government as late as 1940, uh, 41, after, after working with the government uh, for four years and often making a lot of money in the process, uh, they had come to take a more benign view of the federal government and of its involvement in the economy. Uh, they didn't all like it, uh, but far more of them accepted it and a great many of them had discovered they could work with it and make money by doing so. So that the one sector of our economy uh, that has had the potential to successfully resist the growth of government stopped trying to do so in any mass fashion from 1945 on. So that since that time, business resistance is ad hoc it's uh, episodic, it's focused on the fire that they want to put out today, but uh, to say that business in general is a serious, hostile opposition force to government would be a false statement uh, for any time in the past 50 years. And I believe that the bulk of that switch in business sentiment is owing to the experience of World War II. Well, let me qu quit here and entertain your questions or hear your comments. Yes, sir. Um, can you comment on the monetary policy throughout the period we've been looking at on the graphs here? Mm -hmm. I'm just curious as to the rapid growth we, we've seen on some of the graphs at the end of the war, let's say 46, yes. as opposed to periods of the Great Depression mm -hmm. and even parts of the war. Right. And is that due to... Uh, pumping of the money supply mm -hmm. by the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. or what, what changes are taking place right. through that period? The, uh, the Federal Reserve was, it was, it was actively injecting uh, reserves into the banking system throughout the war, and in addition, uh, owing to changes uh, in its authority by one of the War Powers Acts uh, at the beginning of the war, it was directly purchasing U.S. government securities, which is to say it was you know, paying for them out of thin air uh, by writing down deposits uh, in the, uh, to the credit of the Treasury Department. Uh, so the money supply during the war years grew uh, about 20% per year. Uh, so that was essential. The government uh, uh, paid for about 60% of its uh, war spending by borrowing. So what was happening, in effect, was that the, the Fed was pumping up bank reserves and either the banks themselves or their customers were buying government bonds. Uh, and so that, that was a critical part of the whole war uh, economic management. Now, what happened when the war ended is that this, uh, this Fed activism uh, slowed down drastically. And so you have a, 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 an episode there in 1946 that do, doesn't uh, jibe at all with monetarist ways of thinking about what's driving the macroeconomy because that, that magnificent economic recovery in 1946 uh, took place notwithstanding a, a drastic deceleration of the Fed's uh, increases in the money stock. Now, what, what a monetarist would say to me at this point Indeed, some have said to me in the past is that, is that no, uh, go back and look at the graph. Uh, what you see in, in 1946 is what a monetarist would expect from a deceleration of the money stock. <laughs> a big uh, downward uh, lurch in uh, GDP. Uh, but even the monitors have trouble accounting for uh, that transition period between 1945 and 47 because in, in general there are many, many uh, deviations from their forecast. When, when did the deceleration start? When was the economy allowed to liquidate, so to speak, to mm -hmm. allow for real growth? 
Uh, well, what w what was uh, going on in that t period right after World War II? I I've written another article about it, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's fairly uh, complicated, so I probably shouldn't try to summarize it here. Uh, that that article is uh, is called uh, "From Central Planning to the Market," and uh, it was published in the uh, Journal of Economic History in, in 1999. It's available. Uh, at the website onpower.org uh, if you want to look it up there. Uh, the the uh, transition, which was tremendously successful, uh, I think owed everything to just the removal of controls, uh, uh, which was quite rapid in late 45 and early 46. And uh, the financing came uh, very largely from the fact that that uh, that the saving rate, which had been running at about 25 percent in, in the last three years of the war, fell back to ordinary levels of, of, of five to ten percent per year, and so uh, those funds, as it were, were were removed from bankrolling government bond market and uh, made available for a combination of consumer spending and private investment. So we were able in 1946 to, to simultaneously have a private investment boom and to increase consumer outlays at the same time. Uh, so that, that, that's part of what was happening then. But uh, the aggregate monetary situation doesn't really, I think, have a, a lot to tell us about uh, why the transition uh, went as it did. Brad? Yeah, a couple questions on the first things you covered. The Neutrality Acts in the 1930s, were those signed by Roosevelt or were they before that? No, they were they were all during Roosevelt's uh, term. Uh, they were in 1934, uh, 5, and 6, as I recall. Uh, there was another one in 1939, but in a way it was a, it was a Neutrality Act that... Uh, that uh, took away some of the restrictions put in place by the preceding ones uh, and, and uh, put in place the so-called uh, cash and carry provision, which, which meant that uh, you still couldn't uh, give credit to foreign purchasers of arms in this country. Um, uh, they had to pay for them and, and they had to take them away in their own shipping. So, again, the idea was let's not get American ships out there carrying munitions torpedoed and that be, then become a pretext for, for the U.S. Uh, going into the war. Uh, by that time, pe pe people realized that the sinking of the Lusitania and the Sussex and those kinds of events had been used for propaganda purposes to help persuade Americans to, to go into World War I. And so the idea was, well, we'll, he we'll help the British. We'll let them come over here and, and buy uh, military goods. Uh, but that's all we'll do. Uh, presumably, we were, we were also in a position, at least according to these laws, to sell military goods to the Germans. But, of course, it was perfectly clear to everybody that wasn't going to happen. Be, because if nothing else, the Roosevelt administration would not have permitted any of our arms companies to sell arms to the Germans. And uh, there, there's now available uh, collections of correspondence between Roosevelt and Churchill. Uh, huge, huge book uh, before, uh, before the war. Uh, so you've got all the correspondence uh, of those two, uh, and and. Uh, What's it called, Joe? Some, something like a Churchill Roosevelt correspondence, I yeah. think, or some such title. Uh, it's a huge uh, edited volume, and, and, and this is extremely revealing of how closely uh, the United States and the British were working on purely military arrangements before the United States ever declared war. Uh, they were working absolutely in harmony uh, equipping one another, passing information back and forth. Uh, uh, the United States was at war. Uh, you read this correspondence, it's undeniable. The United States was actively at war uh, by cooperating <laughs> uh, 
in a multitude of ways with the British uh, and, and in supplying them. Uh, so uh, th- this, you know, this neutrality was opposed uh, in, in 1941. Why did Roosevelt sign those acts of John Acts in 34 and 35? I think at that time he really wasn't much interested in this subject. It didn't seem very important. Uh, Roosevelt was very focused on his New Deal policies uh, when those neutrality acts were passed. Uh, he, he decided uh, to uh, switch over and become Dr. Win the War, or, or at least Dr. Uh, Dr. Rearrange the World, uh, after 1938, uh, because uh, by 1938 the New Deal had been brought to a halt uh, by the so-called conservative coalition, a combination of uh, uh, Southern Democrats uh, and Northern Republicans who had by that time decided to join forces and, and, uh, and prevent the enactment of further New Deal type legislation. Uh, uh, this, this was in part a reaction to that uh, uh, recession that began in 1937 uh, and which persuaded many people that the New Deal had completely failed. I mean, if you look where things were in 1938, uh, even if you look at these standard data, here's, here's 1929 and here's 1938. <laughs> well, we're a long way from prosperity and we're going in the wrong direction in 1938. So many people said enough is enough. Uh, th- this is not what we any longer want to support. Uh, and... Uh, Roosevelt's court packing plan alienated many people because it, it, it made it seem correctly that he was really uh, seeking to uh, acquire dictatorial power. And even many Democrats at that point said, <laughs> we really don't want Roosevelt as a dictator. The War Powers Act. Yes. Early on. Are they still on the books? Uh, not those particular ones. They they expired uh, after the end of the war. But there are there are other acts that uh, uh, give some of the same powers to the president. Uh, there there are a number of emergency powers laws that are currently enforced. Uh, the the laws were amended in the late 1970s uh, after the church committee hearings that revealed so many ab- foreign policy abuses, but, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the laws that are still into, uh, in effect now permit presidents to basically take over the bulk of economic life simply by declaring an emergency. Uh, and uh, those... Those laws are used for various purposes whenever a, and a trade sanction is put into effect or, or the continuing sanctions against Cuba or, or you know, the sanctions we have against uh, Libya and North Korea and Vietnam and, and so forth all grow out of those emergency powers laws which allow the president to cut off trade or financial flows or, or travel uh, uh, by Americans to, to designated countries. Uh, the Trading with the Enemy Act that was passed in 1917 is still uh, in force as amended, uh, but uh, under that law, the president can and sometimes does simply uh, <coughs> decree uh, that certain international financial transactions may not be made or must be made in a certain way or can be made only under license by the federal government. Um, uh, I wrote a couple of articles about those uh, with Charlotte Twight, and she actually did the research for the most part involving those uh, emergency laws of the 1970s. So if you want to find them, they're they're again available online uh, at at Uh, onpower.org. From the titles, you can you can easily identify what what they are. Uh, Onpower.org. Let's see where we are. I think we'd better quit now, ladies and gentlemen. I've run you over time. <laughs>